Okay, in order not to lose time, I will start this wonderful fireside chat this afternoon. Good afternoon from Hong Kong and good morning to those of you in Europe, um, one of whom is, is certainly the, the person we are talking about today. Um, my name is Mario Dimsey and I'm one of the co-chairs of Hong Kong 45. Um, Hong Kong 45 is extremely proud and pleased to present this event, which is the third fireside chat in our initiative to showcase female talent in arbitration. This initiative is extremely important to us and we are so honoured and humbled to have secured the support and time of so many wonderfully eminent women who practice in international arbitration, some of them with very varied career paths. And um, this, is, this is precisely the kind of initiative that we are, are looking to enhance and, and develop um, going forward with, with the HK45. This brings me very nicely to our guest and our speaker today, Domiti Bezu. We are very, very grateful that she has found the time in her normally busy schedule but this week, especially busy schedule to come and, and, well, not to come, but to virtually speak to us today. She will be chatting to Saraj Sajnani, who's an associate at King and Wood Mallison's here in Hong Kong. And he's a newly minted colleague on the HK45 committee, committee with us. Um, in my opinion, Domiti does not need an introduction. I know Saraj shares this, but nevertheless, we will, of course, um, be introducing her properly when I hand over to Saraj. Uh, before I do that, allow me just briefly to speak about the HK45. Um, as most of you watching this probably know, this is the HKIC group for the young and young at heart arbitration practitioners in Hong Kong and further abroad. Um, we are very active in Hong Kong, even during these tr um, troubling times. You will have seen we're doing quite a few webinars and this series of fireside chats about um, showcasing women in arbitration at the moment. And of course, once the restrictions are eased and we're able to, to travel as before, um, we will be doing more in the region again. In addition to Hong Kong and APAC, we also have a very competent network of global regional ambassadors who support the HKIC, HK45 initiatives. And if you're interested in becoming a member of HK45 or interested in becoming a regional ambassador, you're more than welcome to, to let us know. Um, with respect to HK45, we do encourage you to join if you're not a member yet. Um, it's free and we welcome as many members as, as um, are willing to join. Um, I think that's all from me. Um, I know you're here to hear Domiti, very ably moderated by Siraj. So thank you for listening in and supporting this initiative. I'm sure you will enjoy this chat. And with that, I'll hand over to Siraj. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marielle. Uh, I'm going to just take uh, your video off right now, and that will uh, put Domiti and I um, as the remaining screens here. Thank you. There we go. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us at uh, this chat. Uh, as Marielle said, it's our third uh, in the series of fireside chats showcasing female leadership in international arbitration. Uh, I'm very pleased today to be joined by Domiti Bazo, uh, who has very graciously, graciously accepted uh, the invitation and agreed to tolerate me from a very early hour in Geneva. Uh, now, for those of you in the international arbitration scene, uh, you'll know that Domiti needs very, very little introduction, but it would be absolutely wrong of me not to start off with at least uh, a few highlights of her many, many accomplishments. Uh, Domiti is a co-managing partner uh, at La Livre. Uh, she specializes, of course, in international arbitration. Uh, she's been in the arbitration scene uh, since well before it was cool and hip, uh, since about the late 1990s. Uh, she has her fair share of accolades and very, very amazing quotations from the directories, you know, razor sharp, brilliant, all of that kind of thing. Uh, but there was one description of Domiti in one of these directories that stood out quite a lot to me. So uh, I'm going to repeat it here. As an advocate, Domiti is incredible to watch, not something that is said about many lawyers. Uh, like many of us in international arbitration, uh, Domiti has made it a point to be very hooked into the international organizations around the world for arbitration. But um, unlike many of us, uh, Domiti has quickly rose to leadership positions in these various organizations. She is on the governing board of ICA, She's a member of the court of the ICC, uh, and she was until very recently very actively involved in the Swiss Chambers Arbitration Institution and the ASA. 
last Friday, Domiti was also appointed to the HKIAC Council and the HKIAC Proceedings Committee. Uh, and similar to her practice, uh, Domiti is very, very international herself. She has lived on three different continents. Uh, she is of European descent, but she has not spent all of her life in Switzerland. Uh, she grew up in Africa. She attained a diploma of law in Paris and then went on to earn her LLB in New Zealand no doubt achieving a first-class honors there too. She first practiced in Christchurch, specializing in domestic litigation in New Zealand, and then made her journey back to the Northern Hemisphere to Paris and is now based in Geneva. She's now licensed to practice in England and Wales and in Switzerland. Uh, and that's just her professional life. Uh, Domitie and I had a short pre-chat earlier this week and she was very quick to remind me that all of this glitz and glamour is actually her fourth job after mother, wife, and daughter. Uh, with that very brief, and I'm sure yet too modest introduction, uh, it's over to you, Domiti. Uh, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about uh, your upbringing? Uh, I know that you grew up in Africa with uh, two brothers. Uh, what was that like? Thank you very much, uh, Suraj. Good uh, afternoon. Uh, everyone, uh, it's, it, it's a great privilege to be here and thank you for your kind words of introduction, uh, Suraj, that make me feel very special. It's a very nice way to start the day, I have, I have to say. Um, I, I, I'm glad you started by uh, my upbringing because it allows me to talk about uh, my parents and in particular uh, my mother. Um, I had a very privileged uh, upbringing in Africa where my father was born and where my parents lived for many years. And I, uh, they moved back there when I was six months old. Uh, so that's where I spent most of my childhood. And it was a, a very happy upbringing, not only because um, it was a very easy life as an, as an expat uh, in, in Africa, uh, but because it was a very egalitarian uh, family. I grew up with two older brothers, um, but when it came to gender, it was very clear that being a woman uh, was not going to make any difference. Uh, there's a funny story that goes around in the family about me uh, telling my brothers when I was about 10 that uh, one day it would be payback time. I was going to be the boss of my own company and I wasn't going to give them a job. But the interesting bit about that story is I don't think there was any doubt uh, in my mind or in their mind uh, that I wouldn't be able to do this uh, because I was a woman. Um, and it was a given because it was a given that I would go to university like my brothers and that I would do whatever I wanted. Uh, my mother, who's obviously from another generation, married when she was 18 and, and gave up university when she got married. And she gave me two very important uh, messages. The first one was being the privileged child that I was able to go to school and university, I had to do it. The only thing I was not allowed to do was to not go to university. Um, and the second uh, 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 message, which was very important was, as a woman, there's only one trap you have to avoid and that's becoming financially dependent on a man. So it's okay to get married, it's okay to have children, but it's not okay to stop working and become financially dependent. And these two messages had a huge impact on me, on my level of confidence, on the choices that uh, I made, and on the fact that I never approached life thinking I would have major hurdles to overcome because I was a woman. Uh, and I never let a man rule my life or rule my choices. And that was also very important. So it sounds, um, it sounds like being brought up in that very um, egalitarian society, giving, getting, getting a lot of choice, uh, it sounds like you were given pretty free reign uh, to choose anything you wanted to do. Um, so what made you choose this career path? Uh, what made you choose uh, you want to be a lawyer? Did you, did you mm -hmm. always want to be a lawyer? No, I didn't. You're right. I felt I could do anything. And, and, and for the participants, if you have daughters in particular, it's really important to keep hammering in that message. Uh, uh, when I got my baccalaureate when I was 17, I wanted to be a diplomat. I wanted to join the foreign office. 
And I, I, I spoke three languages. I was fascinated by international relations, by geopolitics, international economics. I had never thought of law, but life uh, played its first trick on me. I failed the entry exam into Sciences Po, which was the school to go to in those days uh, to join the foreign office. Um, so the way, the way you could join the foreign office if you failed Sciences Po was to get a law degree and then join at the master's level. So I did that. I went to law school uh, in Paris and uh, very surprisingly, it was pretty much love at first sight. But the interesting part of the story, I think, is that it wasn't French law that was love at first sight. Uh, it wasn't spending four hours commenting on a three-line article of the Civil Code on tort liability. It was actually English law. And English law was a compulsory paper. And right from the beginning, uh, you dealt with issues like Mr. Smith has just lost his entire business because he was delivered defective equipment. How are you going to advise Mr. Smith? And I thought, this is what I want to do. And I realized at the end of my first year that French law wasn't going to do it for me. It was too academic. So I decided to go to London to do a law degree. But then life played another trick on me. Um, and 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 from from what I gather from our pre-chat, this is about the time uh, you did you did the year of law in France, but then after that you did this massive geographical and you went all the way to New Zealand. Um, so why New Zealand? And and don't get me wrong, I, I I absolutely love New Zealand. I was I was in Queenstown some time ago, and it's it's a wonderful place. But how did you choose to move your career from Paris all the way across the world to New Zealand? Uh, tell me a bit about that. So uh, I actually did two years of law in France. I finished a proper law diploma. I felt that that, that bit was, was quite important. Uh, and it's a very short answer. My then boyfriend, who became my first husband, was a New Zealander. So uh, he did not rule my life, but he introduced me to this fantastic country and gave me the opportunity to go and study law uh, in a very good law school and a very highly rated. I mean, I... I had my eyes set on London, but I investigated New Zealand law schools. I realized there were a lot of New Zealand lawyers in London. It was very highly regarded. So I went on a, on a five-week holiday tour to New Zealand, uh, and I uh, interviewed the deans of the University of Auckland, uh, Victoria and Canterbury. I visited the campuses, and in a few weeks, I decided that that's where I was going to be. Uh, much to my mother's uh, horror, as you can imagine, uh, I was only, I had just turned 19 and I went to the furthest place on earth from my parents and there were no internet, no cheap phone, no WhatsApp, no Skype, no nothing in those days. It was one fax a week and it used to cost me $1 per page and it was 10 minutes on the phone once a month, uh, which, would co which used to cost me an arm and a leg. For, you know, no students there. So it was a very big move. Just thinking from like a from like a globe perspective, there's really not all that much further you could there actually isn't. have gone. I checked. No. <laughs> there isn't. I checked. And she checked. I can tell you my mother checked. <laughs> um and so 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 when when you did go to New Zealand uh and, and you were in law school, um what was it what was that whole experience uh like at that time? Uh, and in particular I'm thinking things like um you know, sticking with the theme of uh, diversity and uh, female leadership, um, what was the gender balance like in law school at that time? Um, I know certainly when I went to law school, um, it really, uh, it, was, it was sort of a fair split of uh, male students and female students. And, mm -hmm. and it really didn't matter in any discussion uh, or any activity like, like mooting or law journal. It didn't matter if uh, it's, 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 a, it's a guy that you're speaking with or a girl. It was just uh, they were just all other students. Uh, so what about for you going through law school uh, in New Zealand at that time? What was it, what was it like? Were, were people even talking about diversity back then? Was it a thing? I think what you described at law school was very similar, even though um, it was a, a very long time ago. Uh, I was trying to calculate exactly how many years, but I, I, I gave up. But the, the, it, was, it was very similar. The only thing I would say is, um, diversity in New Zealand 20 years ago was very much, um, the word wasn't, but feminism 
and cultural diversity or um, uh, discrimination issues. That was very much at the forefront. And I remember um, thinking New Zealand is way ahead of any other country I've seen. Uh, and I had traveled quite a bit back then already. And I still think that today. I mean, we all know of Jacinda, Jacinda Ardern, who's just an incredible uh, uh, prime minister yeah. for New Zealand, an incredible woman. But, but back then already, the country was full of incredible women. And for me, it was a huge eye opener. So gender equality was a very big thing, despite New Zealand being a very conservative uh, country, in, at least in the rural parts of New Zealand. Um, and it was an eye opener because I knew about the theory of feminism, I knew about Simone de Beauvoir, etc. But I could sense that things, at least in French society, were very different. And uh, I knew a bit about practical feminism through my mother and through my aunts, uh, all of whom went to university and, and, and had jobs. But uh, people didn't talk about feminism in France. It was a dirty word. I learned in New Zealand to define that word, not, not, as equal, not, not with the concept of equality, if you like, but really the concept of equal opportunity. And that was true at law school, but that was true uh, throughout campus. And, and for me, there were two defining moments on, on that journey, that awareness about the importance of equal opportunity for women. Uh, the first one was meeting my then mother-in-law, who was a truly amazing feminist, a psychologist, a, a very active woman and became my mentor. Um, and the uh, second one was to actually study. It was called feminist studies in those days. I it's remember you mentioned it was, it was actually, it was called feminist studies. I, I don't yeah, know if they would name that. a course just, just the same these days. You wouldn't, and my mum was wouldn't horrified. wouldn't be PC to do so. Yeah, no, no, my mum was horrified that there could be such a thing as feminist studies. She thought that New Zealand was very backwards, whereas yeah. in fact, they weren't, it was the other way around. So, and, and, and the other thing that was striking uh, on that diversity theme about New Zealand is New Zealand society is very egalitarian. There's much less of a class system than there is in Europe, and in particular, uh, the kind of class system I, I grew up in, and that was a huge, uh, a huge eye opener, and that also had a deep influence on me. And and uh, right right after law school, um, I gather that you you then you then stayed on in New Zealand. Um, so you know law, law school was ver was very influential, and and you learned uh, so much about feminist studies as well. Uh, and then you chose to stay on uh, in practice in New Zealand as well, and you were focusing at that time on commercial litigation. So, so what was that like at that time? Were you, were you doing any international arbitration at that time at all? No, I was a commercial litigator and I absolutely loved those years in private practice. My, my first boss, who was also the president of the New Zealand Law Society and a great litigator, uh, I, I said for about 15 years, he taught me everything I know. I think now would be a bit difficult to say that, uh, but he was fantastic. I had a very diverse practice in a law firm about the size of La Leave today. Um, I was in court every second day because in New Zealand, you're a solicitor and a barrister. Uh, and I did some very exciting cases. My main area of practice was PI insurance work. So defending uh, in particular local authorities against uh, 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 tort claims. And I remember defending the Queenstown City Council following a rafting accident on the Shotover River. You mentioned Queenstown before. I, I was, so I was just years. there some time ago. Yeah, and I, you know, a, 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 an American tourist who died on the Shotover River and the Queenstown City Council was sued uh, yeah. in tort. That was a great case. I remember another one, uh, uh, which was the, the, the uh, seat, if you like, the forum was Invercargill, which is a, a town at the bottom of the South Island. Yeah, uh, a very small town, but it's got a high court there, but it has no permanent judge. So to go to my hearing, I hopped on a plane, a four seater. It was the pilot, the judge and me <laughs> on the plane. And we flew over the west coast of the South Island to go to this hearing. It was just fantastic. That's the sort of thing uh, that I did. But interestingly, I didn't do arbitration. But in those days, I had my eyes set on the bench. And yeah. what I wanted to try and do uh, was not to wait till I was 60 to become a district court judge, but actually try and get 
to the high courts by becoming a master of the roles. You could become a master quite early in your career, yeah. and then you would move on to become a high court judge. Yeah. Little did I know, little did I know that at age 35, I would be sitting as an international arbitrator. <laughs> Another trick life played on me. And, and that's and that's interesting. I, I I mean, from from what I gather, I mentioned the master of the roles title. Maybe it's maybe it's a little different because in in the UK it would it would take quite some time even um, to 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 do that. And I think there there there's only one master of the roles. It sounds like in New Zealand there are, there are multiple almost. So it seemed like there yeah, were. They're, they're attached to the high. The master was attached to the high courts. So right. It the high court. And right. There were so like the masters in Hong Kong, yeah. Much. But the master of the role dealt with summary disputes in commercial cases yeah. and commercial list, the litigation yeah. cases, the bankruptcy cases. But it was a place where you could go quite young, you know, yeah. like in the 30s or late 30s, you could yeah. be able to there. That's, wanted, I'm not saying I would have managed it too much, <laughs> but I had my eyes on that. You had, your, you had your eyes on, you know, get onto the bench. Yeah. Show the brothers. Yes. <laughs> So now let's let's talk let's talk about um, your move uh, back to back to France. Uh, so and that's that's when you pivoted uh, back into well you pivoted for the first time into international arbitration. Now um, I was trying to understand this. So you you went from Christchurch doing domestic litigation into fresh fields in Paris doing um, international commercial and investment treaty disputes and and that's pretty much right there at the that you know with the top of the pack of high quality IA work. Um, now, how did that move happen? Um, what were what were the drivers behind that move? You know, I hate to say, but it wasn't career planning. It was yeah. another personal uh, uh, personal change in my life. I uh, got divorced. I was still quite young. I was in my late twenties. I was nearly thirty, and I thought I've never lived as a full grown up and never worked in Europe. And I would like to try that. And if I don't like it, I can come back to New Zealand. Mm -hmm. uh, so I moved there. Um, and on the advice of many New Zealand lawyers I knew who had worked in London, they said, look, apply for a job at Freshfields or Allen and Overy uh, in litigation. You'll get a job, no problem, in London. And I thought, well, I'm going to apply in Paris as well, because I'd quite like to live in Paris rather than London. And Freshfields contacted me for a position, not in litigation, but in international arbitration in the Paris office. Um, and I had a pretty scary interview with Jan Paulson uh, that lasted about an hour and a half. Um, and I say scary because in those days, I didn't even know what the New York Convention was. I didn't know what an arbitral seat was, and I'd never heard of international arbitration rules. Uh, but I still made it through the interview. I got the job and I had three fantastic years. Uh, it was the best introduction I could have thought of uh, for international arbitration. And I made some fantastic friends. I'm not going to do any name dropping, but most of them are uh, very well-known arbitration practitioners nowadays. And, and we remain very close. These were very special years. And, 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 and you mentioned, you know, you were, you were thinking, all right, let me, let me try Europe out. And if not, I'll still, you know, I can, I can always just go back to New Zealand. Um, do you at all think you'd ever want to go back to New Zealand uh, now? No. No. no? And the reason the mountain, is the I realized, no, I realized being back in Europe, I still suffered from the fact that it was an island. You know, the closest place from Christchurch yeah. on a plane is Melbourne, and it's a three-hour flight. It's far. And I actually did feel isolated from the rest of the world. The fact that I grew up in Africa, I had some family uh, still there, some family in France, it was actually quite difficult. Mm -hmm. And the move, to, the move to Geneva was actually very much about trying to, it had a personal element to it. Mm -hmm. Trying to reproduce a lifestyle with the lake, the mountains, mm -hmm. close to nature that was very similar to what I had had as a child in Africa and what I'd had in New Zealand. Um, but then, of course, there was also a, a, a professional uh, element to that. And, and to go back to the topic of the day, I realized at Freshfields that a large law firm like this, where you can't change anything, uh, wasn't my thing. And... The, the one thing I realized for the first time in my life was that being a woman may become an obstacle. This was a firm back then at Freshfields where if you were a woman associate, you didn't have the same opportunity. There was one woman partner in Paris. And let me tell you, 
she wasn't the nicest person on the planet. And I just thought, I don't want that. I need to go somewhere else. I had my eyes set on Geneva and there was one firm where I wanted to go because I had met Pierre Lalive at a hearing in Beirut, my very first international arbitration hearing in Beirut. And that place was Lalive. So that's what happened. I applied for a job. They weren't yeah. advertising. Yeah. And huge luck. They were looking for someone who yeah. was common law trained, yeah. but spoke fluent French. And that, I got the job. Perfect. My husband got a job. Yeah. My, my, my new husband, my, yeah. my second husband. Yeah. He got a job. He's a doctor. He got a job here. And we just moved here. And you fell in love with it and never looked back. No, I never looked yeah. back. Yeah. Geneva is a fantastic place. It's got all the advantages of a big city without any yeah. of the inconvenience. It's, it's a bit boring. It's a bit boring. I'll give you that. But if you're my age, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. It's interesting you mentioned the mountains uh, just then because I was, I was thinking when I was in, in Queenstown, I was, having a, I was having a chat with a, with a friend that was there at the same time. And we were talking about, okay, what, which other places are there with, with beautiful mountains? And we thought, okay, South Africa, Switzerland, New Zealand. And that, that's literally the, the three that you just mentioned of trying to recreate that, you know, wonderful scenery experience. I mean, there, there are a lot of beautiful things about Hong Kong, but the mountains in each of these places, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, now, you, you mentioned uh, just then about um, obstacles as uh, a woman. Now, now, tell me a bit about how you personally navigated um, the many roles that, that you're playing, um, you know, wife, uh, mother, daughter, lawyer, um, very senior lawyer, managing partner of the firm. Um, how did you balance all of these different roles? Let me start by saying it's not easy. Anyone who tells you you can do it with the right help, it's no problem. Treat it as a small, having children as a small issue to have to deal with, it is lying. Uh, it's not easy. You struggle with yourself every day. Um, I have to be extremely organized. I've always had until last year, live in Nanny, mm -hmm. uh, who's always been, uh, uh, almost always been a New Zealander. Uh, I had to be prepared to cut down on sleep. But much more importantly, I had to accept that I couldn't have it all. I had to make choices. I had to make sacrifices. Um, for example, less time with friends to have more time with family in addition to work. And I had to follow my heart because you're constantly under pressure. Uh, people telling you what to do. You should work less. Uh, you should get more childcare and spend more time at work rather than worry. You just have to do what is right for you. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the only way I, I managed it, uh, so to speak, because I still think I worked far too much when my children were young, and it's something I try not to reproduce in my firm with our female uh, young partners and senior associate with children. Uh, I had amazing support from my husband um, and amazing inspiration by having two girls. I've got twin girls who are 12 today. And I thought to myself, how can I encourage them the way I got encouraged by my mother to go to university, to follow their dreams, to do what they want, if I also have to drop into the story, oh, and uh, by the way, uh, when you came, you know, to this world, I just put everything on hold. There was something that didn't work in my mind. Um, uh, today, um, I realized that uh, I, I am a role model for them, and that helps me uh, every day uh, as well. And they're very proud of me, which helps. You know, that's that's that's. Um... That's incredible. When you said when you said they're they're twelve today, do you do you actually mean their birthday is today? No, no. Okay, no, no, right. Okay. I was thinking otherwise, exactly. you know, like that, that, no, that's no, that's no, amazing. No. Happy birthday to them as well. Okay. I um, probably I wouldn't have chosen this date. I yeah, I was I was, I was thinking, yeah. wow, like you know, massive yeah. sacrifices there. <laughs> um on the on that theme of on that theme of uh kids, um, you know, I've 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 got I've got two sisters as well, and um, you know, both both uh very intelligent, but both sort of um had to give up their careers at the time they had children. Um, and unfortunately, this is, this is more often a challenge for, for women than it is for men. Um, now, tell me a bit about your journey through this and, and any tips to you know, young women in particular who are, who are listening in uh, on, on the conversation and might also be facing difficult choices uh, specifically in this regard. You know, the single most important tip 
I think, is to have the right life partner. Um, having a family is a team project. It's, it shouldn't be just about women. It's a team project. And if you're a team, organizing your respective careers is also a team project. The two are completely linked. So I wouldn't be where I am today without the support of my husband. And what I mean by support, it's the genuine moral support, never making me feel guilty if I'm away or, or I can't be there, whilst keeping me grounded. My home is my safe haven. Uh, and also having the logistical uh, support because having a nanny is not enough. You need one of the parents to be to be there. But if you have pressure at home, it's just impossible. And there are so many men out there who know that kids don't grow up on trees. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so much easier for them to have yeah. their partner, their female partner, stop work, look after them as well as look at after the children. Uh, but the point is, why should it only be easier for the men? So that's where it starts. It starts in the private sphere. So today, my, my daughters, as I said, they're, they're 12. And I see that their minds are completely free of gender stereotypes. Not only because I don't cook and my husband does most of the cooking, uh, but because they've seen me work and they've seen my husband supporting me in that. And that's to me, is absolutely key. Uh, and I'm very proud of that, I have to say. I don't often say I'm proud of something I've done, but I'm extremely proud of that with my daughters because I know that they will be able to make real choices. They may choose not to work and have their children, but at least they have had real choices uh, in their mind. And, and the other tip is this, um, you have to be flexible. Uh, you can't have it all at 100%. But if you play your cards well, if you choose the right employer for when you have children or, or the right firm, you define your boundaries at home and at work, you can do both. That's what I always say. You can have both a family and work. I don't cook cupcakes for school fairs. As I said, I, I don't know how to cook. But when I was not traveling in the last 12 years, I was with my children every single morning. My diary was blocked until 9.30. That was not negotiable. And I was always home just to put them to bed or read a story. But my husband had his evening blocks for them. So you can make it work. There's yeah. lots of things. But if you think you can have it all, you can't. Don't even try. Well, you wouldn't. But think <laughs> about that. For, for your sisters. Yeah, for your so, 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 so in, incredible, incredible time management and um, find a partner that can cook. If you want, and you a lot of things, and a lot of other things. I don't think my husband would appreciate being reduced to a cook. No, of course but, not, no. But, but uh, yeah. support at home. Very, very supportive, true. very, 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 very supportive partner. Um, now, now you mentioned a uh, firm as well, right? The, the, the supportive firm environment as well. And um, let's, let's, let's go back to talking about um, Lalive uh, for a second as well. Just, just before we do, um, just for everybody listening in, there's a little Q&A box right at the bottom um, of, the, of the Zoom chat as well. So in a couple minutes, we're, we're going to open it up to taking questions from all of you that are watching. So if you've got a question, um, put it into the Q&A box and we'll get to it in a couple minutes as well. I've seen someone has um, done a hand raise. I, I don't really know how to, how to access a hand raise, but there is definitely a Q&A box. So put, put some questions in there. Um, now, uh, Domiti, we were talking about um, La Leave. So let's, let's, let's go back to that. So I, I did a, a little bit of uh, Googling around about uh, La Leave and um, you won Swiss Law Firm of the Year last year. And, and of course, um, in the press release uh, for that award, uh, many, many, many factors were listed. But the first one, the, the very first factor listed there was diversity of the firm. And, um, and I, was, I was looking around and it seems that um, one of the younger members of, of your team, uh, Caroline Dos Santos, she's written a, a 20 page paper on, on the topic, quite, quite appropriately named uh, Diversity in International Arbitration, A No Woman's Land. And, and you also mentioned that uh, you, were, you were very involved in um, starting up the La Ligue Women's Network. Now, this to me, all of these little factors here and there, uh, this to me reflects that um, the spirit of diversity, it's, it's really instilled within the, the framework of uh, La Leave. So, 
So how how do you do that? How do you make that happen? How do you put uh, how do you make people put diversity uh, at the forefront of of their thought as well? Um, and I suppose this question is sort of posed as as you know co-managing partner of the firm. How are you encouraging diversity uh, as as a as a trait within the firm? Let me answer the question in a slightly indirect way. I'm often asked whether I've had mentors, professional mentors. I, I mentioned my, my first mother-in-law, but I always, to the question about professional mentors, I always say no. I didn't have one mentors. I had many. Uh, and the most important ones were the male partners at Lelieve when I joined, in particular in international arbitration, and three of whom I worked with, Pierre Lelieve, Bio Heiskanen, and Mathias Scherer. Three I worked with very closely and one litigation partner uh, uh, called Alexander uh, Troller. Um, and they were so important to me because they made me feel the minute I joined this firm that the only thing that mattered about me and for my career and for, you know, the question arose very quickly whether I would join the partnership or not was the standard of my work and my integrity as a person. I signed my equity partnership agreement when I was four months pregnant with my twins. I got offered partnership. I knew I was pregnant, they didn't. I went back, I said, guys, I need to be a bit open here. I'm pregnant and I'm not expecting one, but two. And I don't quite know what things are, how things are gonna plan out. They said, okay, fine. So when are we getting your signature back? And that sent a very strong message to me and to the firm. I was the first one uh, joining the partnership with children and there was only one woman in the partnership um, in, in those years. It gave, me, it gave me an enormous amount of energy to seek to create an environment that would work for me, but more importantly, that would work for young women in the future in the firm as it would grow. And, and then that's what I love the most about joining Lalive is that they allowed me to work and to make changes about the work uh, environment. And the reason I tell the story is because the biggest hurdle that law firms face uh, to, in, in their effort to gain a certain level of gender diversity uh, is retaining, not retaining female talent, or sorry, retaining female talent. Now, we as a firm are very good on pay. All our women at same level are paid the same or more than the men. That includes partner level. Um, but we still go from about 50% female associates to uh, only a third of the female partners. Actually, It's actually a little bit less because we've had one woman retiring, one joining, but also two male promotions. So now it's a little bit less than, than a third. It's a lot. It's the highest figure in Switzerland, but it's not enough. If there are 50, when you start, there should be 50 when you get to the finishing line, if you can call it a finishing line. And we have lost uh, a lot of senior uh, uh, lawyers. Um, so let's face it. What is key is having female partners. That's key to all other forms of gender equality in the profession, yeah, on arbitral tribunals, uh, on panels, as lead counsel on, on cases. That's the crux of the issue. And until law firms address that issue, we will have unequal uh, inequality due to unequal opportunities in law firm. Um, and, and when I joined the partnership, that topic was very close to my heart. Uh, I worked very hard uh, uh, when the girls were little. I wish I had worked a bit less. I very much put the pressure on myself. I don't think I had pressure from my partners. I remember a senior partner telling me, Dimitri, okay, let's look at your cases. Uh, what do you want to keep and what do you want to drop? Uh, I kept two and it, it was too many. I should have kept one, but he told me, he said, how about you keep one, mm -hmm. not two? I didn't listen. Now I try to make sure that when we have senior women who have children, um, that we do two things. We reduce workload and we adjust the type of work. You don't send a young mother to Ecuador to interview witnesses in the jungle or to Khartoum to meet government officials. 
I didn't have to do that. These were cases I was working on. I was still co-lead counsel, but the partner I worked with make sure I didn't have to do that because my kids were too young. Uh, and this is actually becoming true for fathers as well. Because if you say you have to choose the right partner, uh, you have to make sure that the partner also works in an environment where he can take some time off. So sorry, that was a very long answer, but it's a huge pet of mine. And I've spent a lot of energy over the last few years at Lalive trying to make that change. And I do think we're getting there. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's incredible. No, no apologies necessary at all. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic answer. And it's, and it's nice hearing sort of the, the very active steps being taken to, to try to balance out work and, and really encourage diversity because it is so, so important. Um, you know, the, the, the point that you mentioned about making sure there, there are enough partners uh, that, are, that are female as well, because you're, you're absolutely right. The, that, that becomes the, the pipeline to a lot of other roles and in particularly in arbitration, it becomes a pipeline for arbitrators uh, as well. Now, let me, let me turn this around a little bit. Um, uh, what about from the individual's perspective? Uh, so what do you think are the most significant barriers uh, to female leadership? And, and how, did, how did you get around to breaking through these? People often say this, and, and unfortunately, I think it's true. Um, women are their worst enemy. They tend to think, I can't do this. No, I should say no. Uh, I can't believe they asked me. Oh, I'm, I'm probably not going to be good enough at that. Uh, no, if I do it, everybody will find out I'm not that good. You know, the good old um, imposter syndrome. And men think the exact opposite. They know they can't do it, but they tell everybody they can do it, yeah. right? And, and, and that's how they get through where women get stuck. Uh, I had a look at a question that someone just put in, which was about that, about confidence. Uh, and, and, and that person says, some people don't necessarily get the confidence from their childhood. And it is so true. And, and that's why I, I always say, I was very privileged. I was born under a lucky star because I was given that confidence. Uh, and to answer the question, uh, yes, you can work on your confidence. You can get help. Uh, my first mentor, my mother-in-law, who's a psychologist, did a lot of these courses for women on assertiveness. And it's very important because we women don't learn how to be assertive. And because we still live in a society where assertiveness is seen as a form of aggression uh, uh, by men in particular. Now we have wonderful tools available. I remember uh, my mother saying, I wish I'd had all of that when I was young. Uh, uh, you women now are so lucky. So absolutely make use of those because the worst enemy of women is their confidence. What you need to do though, what you can work on is as opportunities arise and your little voice says, oh no, I can't do this. Try to overcome that because each opportunity you seize, each challenge you take is a building block to the next one. I told you, Suraj, the story of being invited to preside a tribunal by Lord Hacking and Jan Paulson when I was I remember this, yes. Yeah. It was my first case as president. Yeah. I was petrified. Jan was also my former boss. Yeah. Uh, I was very worried. I, my little voice said, no, no, you're too young. And then one of my mentors here said, hey, great opportunity, do it. They're here to help. They'll ask it, they will act as a safety net. They're gonna make you do all the work. And this is how it happened. But it was a fantastic experience. And actually that case uh, turned out to be decisive for my career as arbitrator. That's, I, I remember you mentioned the story. It was, it was it's absolutely amazing that, um, you know, that, that all transpired exactly how, how, how you said it did. Um, now I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, end off very quickly on this. Um, uh, so, so let me just ask you uh, a little bit about uh, advice. I'm going to try to do what everybody tries to do when they have a, a captive audience with a lawyer. I'm going to try to get some free advice out of you. So um, the HK45 membership uh, that we have, it's, it's um, you know, as the name suggests, it's practitioners uh, large under 45. So it's a, it's a pretty broad group. So um, I want to try to get advice for uh, a few different groups. So first, what advice would you give to very, very, very young lawyers who are just starting out their career in international arbitration, the, the two to three year qualified group? Uh, what advice would you give to the middle of the pack lawyer, the uh, five to 10 year 
group and uh, see to the recently minted partners. Uh, what were some of the interesting lessons that you learned as a young partner building a practice? Okay, so let me start with the young lawyers because in some ways that's the easy part. Um, the obvious advice is you need academic excellence, rigor, a certain passion for law, because it's hard work at the beginning, uh, a good understanding of new technologies and good language skills. Then you move to the next pack. You need some planning of your career, but I feel like saying not too much planning. I'm not a great believer of planning. Yes, you map things out, but if you map them too much, you can miss opportunities. Life played a few tricks on me, uh, but each trick brought new opportunities. It was not planned, it was not part of the map, uh, but it allowed me to be where I am today. And, and I think that's very important. You hear so much about planning, career planning uh, 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 nowadays. I, I'm a bit skeptical about over planning. Um, for the last group of young partners, I feel like saying, make sure you keep learning from the senior partners team up with them on bd work on client cases there's so much you can learn from that group and at the same time keep the associates on your side without your team of associates you're nothing it's not like i become a partner and i just treat them like my slaves it doesn't work like that um and then let me, if, if I may, give some general advice. I'm going to record, um, I'm going to record and replay that la last bit without your associates. You're nothing to my boss later today. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think beyond that, for all of us, there are some crucial um, skills or personal motivations or abilities you need to have if you want to stand out and make a difference. And what is quite a big community nine arbitration. The, the first one is the ability to work hard, the tenacity in, in that field. There is no substitute for hard work. There's no fast lift. There's no escalator up the learning curve. And the learning curve never ends. It, it just evolves. Um, so it's a long road. It's very hard physically and mentally. And you each need to find the way to last the distance. This is a marathon. And it work has to be part of your life, but and there's no recipe book of how to make it work, but you have to make it work in a balanced way. The second one is integrity. Integrity as a lawyer, of course, regardless of the pressure you're under from a partner, from a client, but also integrity as a person. Um, treating your peers, your colleagues, people around you with respect, uh, with benevolence, uh, unless they really don't deserve it, and there are people who don't uh, deserve it. But in my view, when I look at the good, the great people in arbitration nowadays, there are people with integrity, personal and professional integrity. And the third one is humility. It's actually linked to the first two, to that never-ending learning curve and, and uh, to integrity. And, and the last one is to never lose your critical mind. And that's perhaps more for the young lawyers. Um, be prepared, not scared to question what you read and what you're told, to think outside the box, because that too will make a difference for you as an advocate in, in giving advice to, to your clients. Any um, advice for young arbitrators, people that are getting some of their first appointments? Um, yes, the advice Pierre Lalive gave me. Uh, the first thing he told me when I mentioned that, uh, I, I'd quite like to sit as an arbitrator, he said, Dimitri, it's a huge responsibility. Um, don't be too much in a hurry. You need the experience or, or, or you need the judgment that comes with experience. It's not just about ticking the box. I'm X years PQE. I should get my first appointment. I sometimes hear our associates say that. Um, and he also used to say, much better than I do now, I can't remember how he said it, I tried to remember last night and I, I couldn't. He said, you need humility, you need the curiosity to want to understand what this dispute is about, you need the willpower to do the work to understand what the dispute is about, and then you need the courage to decide. And 
courage, judgment, these are things that come with experience. So my advice is don't be too much in a hurry. It will come. With experience, it will come. People will start uh, appointing you. And last question from me. Uh, I know we've got a couple uh, audience questions on, on the Q&A and on the chat as well. So, so I'll, I'll pose those to you in a second as well. But last question from me. Um, ending off any special advice for women and what, what sort of advice would you give to the next generation of female leaders? Once they're there, the next generation of female, I'm thinking of young leaders, I would say you've got to continue the work and help other women get there. Um, I've already talked about the pet of mine, your private yeah. sphere. Yeah. Uh, you've, got to help, you've got to help yourself before you yeah. expect your employer to help you. And I always say that to my associates. Uh, get your private life organized. We do our bit, you do our bit. But, but beyond that, I'm a huge fan of women helping other women. And um, there's one saying I really like, which I'm sure a lot of people on this um, webinar have heard, is the you shine, I shine approach, which is actually not unique to, to women. You can apply that to with your associates in a meeting, uh, I use it all the time as a technique when we're in groups. It is incredibly effective to acknowledge people around you will actually uh, indirectly make you shine. And I've dealt with the confidence uh, point, but, but that approach I have seen work incredibly well for women. Women who support other women do much better than women who compete with other women. That's... Um Really nice to hear, Domiti. So, I've got uh, a couple of questions on the chat and the Q and A. Uh, so let me let me um, pull those up. The first, first one, one we, the first one I've answered, I think. Yeah, the first one uh, about confidence uh, you've got. I've got one on the chat from Anna Kirk. Uh, hello from New Zealand. Thank you for your wonderful and inspiring chat. Uh, you mentioned New Zealand's isolation. Do you think that the increasing use of virtual platforms brought about by COVID will help to integrate the globe in the field of international arbitration? Well, Anna, I hope so. Um, I, I think that would be wonderful. And um, I sometimes think that my life in New Zealand would have been very different. And I probably would have never left if we'd had the technology, if I'd had the technology we have today. Uh, so I think it will do a lot. Uh, uh, for that, and not only for places like uh, New Zealand, but of course for emerging countries. And I'm thinking in particular of the African continent, um, where uh, it is so difficult to travel from if, if you're not being subsidized. So I, I do hope it will make a difference. And earlier this morning, Suraj and I were chatting about these webinars and how wonderful they are. Um, to, to, to reach out to so many different people. They allow people like me to participate because I wouldn't have time to travel to Hong Kong for this event. Uh, and they allow the reach to be much broader. So that's my answer. I, I, I hope so. I can't tell you I think it will happen, but I hope it will happen. And I, I kind of think so. I'm a great believer. I have great faith in the young generation to use properly what has just happened in the last few months. I see it in our firm. We've just done a survey of on the home office to see how everybody felt about what had happened and to see whether we change our home office uh, policy. I just got the result this morning from my, my HR manager. I haven't gone through it, but she warned me that there's an overwhelming desire to increase home office and to increase the use of technology to meet more often so even our international group, which is about uh, 45 lawyers in total, uh, we don't see each other in person very often. Uh, we see each other in groups, in teams on cases. Throughout the confinement, uh, the associates had regular meetings and we also had a chat room every morning at 10.30 where everybody could pop in and have a chat with whoever was there, just have a coffee. And of course, we don't actually have that in the office. So I, I, I'm, 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 I've got face. Uh, Anna, I hope I'll be proven right. I, 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 quite, I quite like the point that you made, made about, um, you know, the working from home arrangements as well. Even during the time that we were doing work from home uh, in, in Hong Kong for the three months uh, or so that, that we had uh, here in Hong Kong, um, I, I loved it, but it was, it was definitely a mixed view, right? In, in, in Hong Kong, apartments are pretty tiny. 
So a lot of people uh, thought, hey, especially ones living with extended family said, hey, I actually don't like the home office thing so much. I'd prefer to be at the office. But uh, a lot of other people found that they, they work according to their own hours a bit more. So it was, it was actually really quite, quite I, I found it quite nice. Um, there's one more question as well from Emily Hay. Um, what do you think about giving fathers longer paternity leave and strongly encouraging them to take it? as a way of equalizing the pressure on careers that arises from having children. Is there room for that in law firms? Yes, there is. Um, it's a long road to get there, but there is. I think I've touched on that earlier by saying a lot of, a, a lot of what we've tried to put in place for young mothers, uh, which is to lower the, 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 the volume of work and to avoid uh, travels, uh, is, is true for young fathers. So that's on one level. But for exactly that reason, if young fathers are not helped at work, they can't help their partners at home. Um, paternity leave is absolutely key. So in this country, we still have only, I think it's only officially, you get more days when you move house than if you have a child when you're, or you're a man. So in our firm, we have two weeks. Oh, wait, you get holidays for moving your house? Yeah, you get that's amazing. Get you don't get that so often. And, and I, I think someone told me, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly because this firm's already always had quite long paternity leave yeah. and we have two weeks now. But two weeks is not a lot if you think about it. Women have 16 weeks paid leave in this country. Um, but almost systematically, we allow them to extend with unpaid leave. I am slowly working towards extending paid leave. But that's a bit more complicated. And you know, once the law changes for men, and it will in this country, Switzerland is very conservative, but it's highly likely the law is going to change on that very soon. It will then make it easier for employers to go a bit further and extend the leave. Yes, there's a financial cost, uh, but this is about long term investment, right? So and financial cost for law firm is all relative. We are in a business where the profit margin is extremely high. So when I hear people say, no, it's all about the money, you can't do it, I always say, hold on a sec, let's just be realistic. This is about whether partners are ready to take a little bit less money home. So it's not insurmountable as an obstacle if you have the right mindset. I like that very much as uh, uh, an ending point. Uh, Domiti, we're, we're, we're heading to 4.30 here, 10.30 your time. Thank you very, very, very much. Uh, that was super enjoyable. I'm really grateful to have had the chance to, to speak with you and work with you throughout this process. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of the people uh, here, I'm sure everyone here shares that sentiment uh, as well, uh, all the other young practitioners on the call. Thank you once again very much for joining us thank and sharing you, your Greg. journey. Uh, for everybody listening in, uh, thank you for joining as well. Check out HK45's LinkedIn page. Uh, there's a rundown of the next three fireside chats that are happening soon uh, with three more eminent female practitioners. Uh, we have Winnie Tam SC from Hong Kong, the Honorable Madam Justice Susan Crennan uh, ACQC from Australia, and Meg Kinnear of ICSID. So uh, we'll end at that. Thank you, everybody. Uh, wishing you a thank great you. weekend and have, yeah, have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.